Welcome everybody. This is Starting Out Bright. I'm Noreen Savage. Thank you so much for being here. In case we've never met, I just want to tell you very briefly who I am and who I am not. First of all, I'm nobody official with Bright Line Eating, but the program has done a lot for me. And uh, I have came into contact with someone who did Bright Line Eating in 2019, my friend Lori. She posted on her Facebook page that she had lost 57 pounds. And if anybody was interested to find out how to go ahead and message her. So my hot little fingers got over to the messenger as fast as I could. And Lori proceeded to tell me about a book by Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. It's called Bright Line Eating. And in the book, Susan Pierce Thompson discusses four bright lines, no sugar, no flour, three meals a day, and weight and measured portions. And when I heard all that, I was sick because I thought there is absolutely no way I could do this. But, you know, I really like my friend. We got together and we discussed the program a little bit more. And I just let that information sit for two months and I discovered about myself what was going on and that was a lot of pain. 270 pounds, five foot two, my feet were swollen, my knee was in excruciating pain, back pain, sleep apnea, snoring, many nights wondering if I would wake up in the morning. And so that pain got my attention and it propelled me to try something one more time. And I did. I got into Bright Line Eating. Uh, Lori suggested getting into a group. I got into the Facebook group, We Eat Bright with Lines. At the time, I don't think the official was even open. The official Facebook page is a public group. There are many private pages, including Starting Out Bright, which is associated with these Zoom chats. And so here I was in the community in this Facebook group, and I was seeing people lose weight like a lot of weight and they were sharing their successes and their struggles, but I just felt part of this community. And I told myself if I lasted one year, I would do what my friend Lori did. I would post on my page and I would help anybody I could. Well, I'm a Christian and that, and that year came up, I felt God say, Noreen, you can do more than that. You could connect people. And so it was the time of Zooms, and fortunately, people said yes when I asked if they would come on and tell their story. And it's just been a blessing. It's, we've learned so much, haven't we? And so tonight, here we are with Rob Rains. Rob, welcome, and thank you so much for saying yes when you got the message. Thank, How thank are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm honored. Um, could you bring us our, this group here and those who will be watching on YouTube and listening on podcasts? Could you kind of tell us what your entry was into Brightline Eating? You bet. You bet. Um, this really goes back to uh, June of uh, 2018. Um, and I was 
really struggling um, <clears throat> in a lot of areas in my life. And I was uh, somewhere, somewhere pretty close to 400 pounds. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, struggling marriage, uh, struggling financially, and, and my health was pretty poor. And I, I met with an ecclesiastical leader and, uh, you know, just kind of a normal, you know, friendly check in. And he said, Rob, what's, you know, how are things going? What's going on with you? I said, well, honestly, Bishop, I'm, I'm kind of struggling. And he said, well, what's, tell me about where you're struggling. And I said, well, I'm struggling in my marriage. You know, it's really important. It's very important to me to, to have a good marriage. I said, I'm struggling with that, I'm struggling with finances. And I, my health is pretty poor. And he, he sat back and thought for a minute. And I, I swear that I, I absolutely was sure he was going to say, let's, let's focus on your marriage. Because in my mind of the, of the three, that was the most important. But he leaned forward, and I, I, I believe there was uh, some, some spiritual inspiration there. He said, let's focus on your physical health. I said, okay. And long story short, he talked a lot about a change of heart. He talked about it you know, in the way that the Bible mentions it, but then he, he talked about it in re reference to physical health and said, I challenge you to pray and ask God to give you a change of heart with regards to physical health. And I took that challenge. I did so. And a matter of Days later, this probably one or two weeks later, was uh, Father's Day, and the um, the women in our congregation had made some uh, uh, lovely pies for the men in our congregation, you know, to celebrate Father's Day. And I had just gone over and eaten, I think, probably five pieces of uh, delicious and terrible pie. I mean, terrible in the sense of uh, sugary, but uh, delicious in the sense of it, I didn't complain. And uh, and some of the women were in the uh, kitchen afterward, just doing the dishes. And I walked into the kitchen. It was more of a waddle, waddled into the kitchen to say, thank you so much for your service and for, for you know, cleaning the dishes and for the wonderful pie. And I made some self-deprecating remark about the pie I had eaten and about my size. And uh, Liesl Stewart, who, who was a bright line eater, was, uh, was standing there in the kitchen. And she turned around and kind of grasped onto that comment I made. And she said, you know, I've been wanting to, you know, share with you a little bit of my journey. Would you mind if I shared some thoughts about what you just mentioned? I said, you know what? Sure. Fire away. And she shared her experience with Bright Line Eating. Blew me away. I had tried all sorts of different diets. I had tried for, you know, I've been overweight for more than 25 years and been wanting to find some key and to have her share her story in, you know, less than half an hour I was, I was hooked on trying this one more time and I bought the book and started next, the next Sunday was day one for me. Wow. And so now you mentioned a minute ago uh, when you were talking with your bishop, um, you mentioned, you know, the health, your physical, what, what was the shape of your health? Cause I know when we talked the other day, you said that you had some diabetes and, um, there was struggle there. I mean, here you are close to 400 pounds and uh, that's, that's going to be a lot for a body. So yeah. where were you in that health part? So, so that was 2018. I, the, uh, let me, let me give you, let me go back a few years to 2013 when I had actually first realized I probably have diabetes and went to the doctor to get some blood work done. And uh, when I did that in 2013, I, again, some, some of these numbers, I, I'll, I'll give you kind of rough numbers for comparison for, for people in the audience that may, may not um, have medical training, but <clears throat> your uh, uh, cholesterol, for example, should typically be, um, I think, around 200. Is that, am I getting that right? I think so. So cholesterol should be 200 or below. Mine was at 949. Um, A1C should be, I believe it's supposed to be in the four and a half range, something like that, below four and a half. Four and a half to six, maybe, or Four five? and a half to six, okay. I think somewhere in that five and a half to six is pre-diabetic, but, but sure. But yeah, four and a half to five. Um, mine was at 13.5. Fasting blood sugar, which should be somewhere in the ballpark of 100, I think 80 to 120 is a decent range for a healthy person. Uh, mine was at uh, fasting blood sugar was 351. Wow. That's, that's almost unbelievable. Yeah. Like you're almost like ready to have a stroke, I would think. 
Yeah. That point. The, the most alarming was the triglycerides. Those are supposed to be 150 or below. And if you get up to, you know, beyond 250, people start to really get worried. And mine were at uh, just over 6,000, which what? is, that's, yeah, they, that's basically you're a walking time bomb and, 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 or I was a walking time bomb and I was, uh, uh, you know, when, when I went in to see the endocrinologist, she said, I'm not sure if I should put you on medication or rush you to the emergency room because you're, you know. Exactly. I'm not sure if your pancreas is going to explode. She kind of said it tongue in cheek, but, but was really serious about, you know, I, I don't, this is more of an emergency than I think you realize. It's no, I, I'm going to assume we didn't talk about this, but had you been dieting like before? I had dieted a number of times and just had never been able to, never had the willpower to overcome that drive to stick to a diet. Had it been like a lifelong, you know, you know, when did this start out for you? I mean, it takes a bit to get to 400. Yeah. I had started gaining weight. I, I gained a little bit in my late teens, but then lost some while um, I, I was serving a mission for my church in South America and, and the combination of walking and difference in food. I, I lost a lot of that weight, got down to about 165. And then in my early 20s, just started to steadily gain again and uh, just didn't, you know, that from there, it just, just went up. There was some yo-yoing here and there as I tried various things, but it was just kind of a steady climb. Too. So you got, you got the book, I'm assuming. Yeah. You got the I, book. Yeah. Did you join a boot camp or do a 14-day challenge or anything like that? Not right away. I, um, I think I maybe started the 14-day challenge, but really uh, my, my true start was I bought the book and just read it, went through it. You know, I took a, a week to read it from Father's Day to the next Sunday, took the week to read it and get the you know, basic plan down. And then uh, the next Sunday was my official day one. So you, you were married and you had children. Did you just have to zone in on making your food separate from the family or did your wife at the time? I know that you're, you're divorced at this time, but um, what, what was that like? I mean, because this is brand new territory for you. Um, you're going by the book unless Liesl's also helping you. Um, Liesl gave me some pointers here and there, but by and large, I was just, I was going from the book. Okay. And I and was so, de determined to do that. So what were you seeing early on? Um, so to, yeah, uh, my, I knew that my family was going to be supportive, but I knew they were not going to change their eating habits. Right. And so I, I worked to find ways to kind of encourage them to give support. Um, they were pretty supportive, but I, I recognized that there were some areas like the first week, my, my, um, my then wife and one of my kids walked into the, my bedroom and they were carrying one of my favorite Reese's products. And I remember just smelling it and just going, oh my gosh, I'm going to climb the wall. I'm going to scratch the ceiling. I just got to, I was like, you guys need to leave with that chocolate or I need to leave. <laughs> like someone needs to leave the room. Uh, and they, they carried it out. It was just, well, it was pretty crazy. And I'm just so curious because, I mean, your health markers were really off the charts. Yeah. And so now you're going through a detox. You're, you're introducing all this new food. You've got willpower gap going on. Everything's going on. This had to be really something for you. So, but you must have been seeing success too to keep going. I saw some initial success, yes. Um, I didn't, I, I don't have a, an official starting weight or, or my day one starting weight because I didn't have a scale that went that high, literally. Um, but I was able to buy one on day five. And uh, so my official starting weight on day five was 368.8. Uh, and I had, and from there on, I was losing a little over a pound a day. Um, and so I, I'm assuming, extrapolating, I'm assuming I was pretty north of 370, probably between 375 and, and 380 when I started. Um, and then just, just kind of went at that, uh, at that pace. I do want to point out just really quickly for, I know that most of Brightline Eating are women. And most of them are not in the high 300s. So when you're in the high 300s and a man, you lose weight much faster. So I don't ever want to 
given any numbers that would discourage anybody else. If your weight loss is slower than a pound a day, that's okay. You're doing great. Keep, keep going. Even if it's a couple ounces a week, carry on. What was the thing that was keeping you going though? Was it just the weight loss or were you oh. feeling for the first time this change of heart that, you know, had just come up, become a part of you? The change of heart, I think, happened gradually. I, I, I can't point at a single moment and say, oh, there it was. You know, there it hit me. It, I think the change of heart was literally a change of that, the, the limbic brain. And, uh, and it happened over, over time. Part of it was the weight loss. Part of it was, part of what kept me going was the weight loss. Part of it was the support from uh, Facebook groups that I joined and, and became part of. And those, those two things, and I guess just a little bit of faith in myself and a little bit of faith in Susan's program just kind of kept that, kept that wheel turning. Well, you mentioned limbic brain, so I just got to ask you, and I know that you're, you really love studying the brain. Can you talk about that? We did talk about it the other day, about the three parts of the brain and, sure. how, and, and how the brain works. Sure. So really quickly, we, we've got kind of three parts of the brain, a triune brain. The first and most uh, ancient part is that the primal brain, the, the reptilian uh, or our complex brain, sometimes called the lizard brain. And its basic function is to keep you alive. I, when, I, when I talk to audiences, I like to talk about a shield. Just imagine a shield, right? It's protecting you. Its job, it runs the autonomic functions like your heartbeat and your breathing, so that you don't have to think about breathing to breathe, you just do. Um, it, uh, it is in charge of your fight, flight, freeze or fawn response. It's in charge of um, your sex drive and your drive to eat. It, its job is basically to keep you, the individual, alive and then to perpetuate the species, to keep human beings alive. And I, I think it's a, definitely a, a gift from God to, to, you know, to keep us alive and keep things you know, in working order, um, you know, if we get chased by a lion, it floods us with uh, adrenaline and make, lets us run faster than we've ever run. But at the same time, it can also cause problems when we are feeling a threat of, an, uh, of a modern emotion and, and it sees that as a threat and it helps us or tries to help us by dissociating. If we use food as a dissociation or whatever we use, whether it's, you know, drugs, alcohol, food, pornography, gambling, whatever it be, we can use any of those things as a dissociation. And when we do, it, it, it creates this habit. It, it, uh, it kind of shields us from dealing with those emotions and processing those. And I had been uh, stuffing you know, down food, stuffing down my emotions for years. Right. Um, and then the, that second brain, the mammalian brain, uh, the limbic brain, is the seat of our emotions and desires. It is the things that happen inside the limbic brain are the things that I, I believe the, the scriptures and, and the God call the heart. And then the third brain is the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the things that happen inside there are what I believe God and the scriptures call the mind. And so we've got heart and mind, and then we've got this shield that is, you know, when we're feeling threatened, it protects us by you know, driving us to dissociate. And we, part of our job as human beings is to overcome that, to, to live out of our heart and mind and not, uh, not let the, you know, the, the, the lizard brain drive. Yeah, well, when, when we were talking the other day, um, I remember you were saying that you were looking at all that to approach your hunger, like specifically yeah. looking how you felt about hunger. And could you, could you speak to that? Sure. You bet. <clears throat> I, one of the, one of the shifts that I, that I made in my, uh, in, in my change was to, uh, to make a commitment to learn more. So I started that by, by reading Susan's book, obviously, but there were lots more to learn, even, even outside of, of Susan's book, there are lots of things to learn about bright line eating. Some of those came in, in Susan's vlog, some of those came in other ways. And one of them, specifically the one that you're, you're referring to, came when I was dealing with hunger pangs for the first time in a long time. It had been, you know, probably a decade or more since I had felt hunger pangs. 
and because uh, I'd just been stuffing all the time. And so they were, they were a little bit alarming. As I felt them, I associated them with a feeling of loss, with a feeling of um, not enoughness, with a feeling of poverty, of lack, of hunger. And that, was, that created a, an alarming feeling in my system. What was really happening is the lizard brain was creating a feeling in the, uh, it was communicating with the brain too, you know, the, the limbic brain and creating a feeling of fear and saying, this guy's got to eat, you know, let's, let's get some food back in there. Um, but I wanted to deal with, I wanted to process that fear instead of numbing it. And so I, I went and Googled, I said, what causes hunger pangs? I want to learn a little bit more about it. And what I learned is the hunger pangs are actually the stomach contracting, the contractions of the stomach as it goes from a after meal size back down to a pre meal size, kind of like the contraction, you know, contractions to get a baby Mm -hmm. out, but but much, much less (laughs) painful. But the point is, I had been associating the the hunger pangs with loss. And what I realized is the hunger pangs were literally the midpoint between abundance and abundance. And that that just changed the the association for me. I said, "I'm, I'm not in poverty of food. I don't have not enoughness. It's literally the midpoint between I just had a great meal and I'm going to have another great meal. And it's just the body clock going, Hey buddy, you're going to eat in another hour or two. Just get ready. So is this that three o'clock feeling that comes up? Sure. Times. I mean, I'd have to grab a cup of tea. Yeah. But it seemed like it was always about three o'clock. Yeah. It became a friend that just said, Hey, your body's working exactly as it should. And it, instead of being something that caused fear, it was a friend. I was like, oh, oh good. Okay, things are working normally. I'm going to eat in another hour or two. And it, that just, that associating, choosing how to interpret that made a lot of difference for me. And I think in, in our lives, that's one of the things that makes a difference for us when we experience pleasant things or unpleasant things is choosing how to interpret them. Was there any piece of the science that especially spoke to you in the book as far as, you know, like the willpower gap or anything um, that Susan talked about? um, So many things stuck with me. The willpower gap was one. The idea of doing willpower replenishing activities instead of willpower depleting activities was a a major eye opener for me. Um, the several of the experiments that Susan described with rats and, and, and food pellets or sugar water and other things, when she, the, the, specifically the experiment about where rats would have came to associate a, a lever with a food pellet, a lever every time would give a single food pellet. And then if they took the food pellet away and just said the lever does nothing and it consistently did nothing, rats would lose the, you know, they, they lose the drive to try the lever after, I don't remember what it was, but like 50 or 100 tries. They go, all right, I give up. This, this no longer provides my want. But if, if it randomly, once in a while, gave food pellets and other times didn't, they would go thousands of times. Right. And, Intermittent reinforcement. That's, yes. That, yeah. that concept totally changed my journey. It really did. It was... Uh, such a game changer because I was getting into like, well, one little pistachio is not going to hurt me. Well, it really was because it was playing on my brain and yeah. not working out well. And yeah. And that, that made a huge, that like that caused me to fully understand, not fully, but it just to understand at a much deeper level how addiction works and why I had struggled so much with giving in before and, how rigid I needed to be to not give in. I'm curious because you studied this, these three parts of the brain. I'm wondering if, have you ever felt like you're just kind of looking at yourself from above and saying, Rob, what's happening here is the stomach is doing this, or this, this is what I see sometimes. When you yeah. actually have the knowledge, it helps you to be logical a little bit, a little bit more than what at least I was anyway before. I wanted to also ask you about something that I know when we talked was very important to you, a concept of fortifying a city. Yeah. Um, 
that was a, an important part to you. And if you could explain that. Sure. That was, that's a story that actually um, came for, so I'm, I'm a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And one of our books of scripture is the Bible and another book of scripture is the book of Mormon. And there's a story that comes out of the book of Mormon about a, uh, a, uh, a godly, a God-fearing uh, uh, war captain who, I mean, who's defending his people. And <clears throat> there were, so, so there were people that primarily followed uh, Jesus Christ. And there was another group of people that did not know God and that, that would, you know, basically attack. So two warring peoples, let me, very similar uh, stories throughout the Bible as well. Uh, but in this particular case, he, uh, he went around to, to various cities and he fortified their cities. He made them much stronger. And it, it described in detail how they built the cities up. They built these high walls and, and all these different fortifications. But the point was that he made the city so strong that it was almost impossible that as long as they were being guarded, as long as these people were doing their duty to God and be, being alert and paying attention, that it was almost impossible for the forces of wickedness for their enemies to take them over. But he did learn through uh, that sometimes his people would turn away from God. And when the, when the people turned away from God, they got distracted by shiny objects. And then, uh, the, you know, the, the, their enemies would come in and take the city. And once their enemies took the city that was already fortified, it was that much harder. It cost so much more blood to get that city back, to win that city back. And so, the idea of not, now I, I wish I could say I'm a crystal baser and I'm, I'm not, I've fallen off the wagon uh, a few times, but for the, for the majority of the beginning of my journey, I was a crystal baser because the idea of losing a city and having to fight harder to get it back was, was that was a vivid image in my mind. And, um, and so that my, my ecclesiastical leader, my bishop, who had originally given me that challenge to pray for a change of heart each week as I came into church. I shared with him that, that metaphor. And each week when I came into church, he'd ask, he'd say, are you keeping your cities? You lose any cities? I was like, no. You know, my, my way of telling him that I kept my four lines bright, I would say, I'm keeping all my cities. And he would just do this little pump, pump his, the air with his fists. And we just every single week had him just doing this. And I do this. And uh, even if we were across the room from each other, you know, even if he was like up on the stand and I'm sitting out in the congregation, he just look at me. He's like, he just put his fists up. I'm like, yeah. Just That's a just so stuff. wonderful. I love that you personalized that story. I mean, you internalized it for your own situation. And then not only do you feel that and you're growing with it, you know, in your journey, you mm -hmm. have this, this faith leader who is also on it for encouragement that that's just really a beautiful part of your story i think that encouragement from someone else who it's consistent and you know you're you're on a you know it's like you find your tribe right yeah. well you know there are some that are in community electronic you know all of this but there are those we live with and those who are very close friends or in our churches and you know these are those people we can you know, really share our success as well as our struggle. And so that's, that's yeah. just really great. I really love that. Um, but I know it, now is that, is that where um, you also were talking about you develop some powerful shift ideas? Was that part of it? Was that um, coming from those ideas of being strong and being fortified the, so what, what happened is as I, so I've been working on different changes in my life, even before that, that first meeting with my ecclesiastical leader, I've been wanting to change my physical health. I've been wanting to work on finances and been trying to improve my relationships with my, with my then wife and with my children. And so I've been, I've been studying ways to, to improve in general. And one of the concepts that, that I kept falling on, excuse me, was identity. And uh, there's a book that I read called Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. And it's about a, uh, Maxwell Maltz was a plastic surgeon back when plastic surgery was kind of first starting, cosmetic surgery of any kind was first starting. He was a pioneer in that field. 
And one of the things he noticed is sometimes after he performed uh, cosmetic surgery, someone's behavior would entirely change. Like there was a dramatic shift. And then for other people, it was, it didn't change at all. So he noticed things and they were, they changed in ways like you would think it would be normal. You know, if, if you remove a scar from someone's face, that they would then be more, a little bit more outgoing or maybe more confident and maybe date better. Right. Those, those were normal changes. He, ex, he expected those and they happened and he documented those. But then there would be things like uh, a, a young boy is the elementary school age boy who had his nose repaired and his grades at school shot dramatically up. And he thought, well, there's <laughs> Fixing your nose has nothing to do with your grades, but what he, what he fell on, what he kind of discovered or fell into was this idea that psychologists were just figuring this out too. This is like 1950s, 1960s, this idea of identity and how you see yourself inside your self-image and the way that you view yourself has a massive impact on your actions. And so anyhow, sorry, I don't want to get too off track, but I, the point is that I've been studying this concept of identity already and kind of intuiting a lot as I went along. Susan mentioned it in her book. She kind of made a, a couple passing references to identity and changing your identity. And so I already knew, understood this concept. So I was like, okay, so I'm, this is what I'm doing. I'm changing who I, who I am. And so about 125 pounds into my journey, uh, I was down about 125 pounds and I'm talking to a woman in my congregation. She just came up. She said, okay, you've lost a bunch of weight. Tell me what you're doing. I said, bright line eating. And I taught her about it and she bought the book. And she, um, she uh, got about 20 pounds down and then she fell off the wagon and she came back and she said, how are you staying on the wagon? And I said, well, well identity change. You know, I'm, I'm changing my identity. And she said, how do you change your identity? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I've never had to express it. I've never had to articulate that before. I said, but, and, and she kind of said, she said, if you can figure that out, you can help a lot of people. And that, that kind of like you said or earlier when you said, I'm a Christian, and that idea of helping people just like, like hit you in your heart. When she said that, that hit me in my heart. Her words have, have like prompted an <laughs> entire change here. Well, think about this collision of losing 125 pounds. You are already, you're seeing so much change in yourself. You have a group, I'm sure, that you're now in. You know, by now, I don't know if you then did the boot camp or whatever, but you are seeing other people. Yeah. There is this hope, at least I know I feel like, that this hope that if I can just help one more person, you know, it's just like so much joy to me. Yeah. And so I can only imagine that in your congregation when someone's coming up and she's already tried this same program and is basically asking for a lifeline Yeah, and you possibly can give it to her. If you can figure out how to articulate how you changed your identity. So you got to tell us. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I took her challenge. She's, she's like, how, you know, how do you do that? Can you tell me? And I went home and I did a lot of praying and thinking and uh, meditating and writing. And I came up with uh, seven shift. So, so the point is that you want to shift your identity. You want to take it from, I wanted to shift my identity from a fat man trying to lose weight to a healthy man. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the mantra I had been using, I'll, I'll share it with you. It's a little vulnerable, but I've been saying it for years was I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm strong, muscular, trim, fit, handsome, and healthy. And uh, handsome's kind of subjective, but the rest of those, you can, you know, you can kind of figure out if you are or not. And I've been wanting to be those things for so long. So, long. so that was the shift in identity. When I, I went and asked God, I said, how do I, what did I do to shift my identity? Help me to kind of go back and figure this out. And I came up with seven smaller shifts that if you shift these behaviors, these things, then it's, it's like doing a combination lock. When you get all the tumblers in place, you can then open the lock. And that was the thing is I, I had to get each of these tumblers in place for the identity shift to unlock. Well, we got to hear them, Rob. <laughs> Happy to share. Them. This is, oh, you bet. This is my pleasure. I, I love sharing these. So the first one, I, I, I give them the name powerful, right? Because they really are. First one is powerful thoughts. And that is a shift from believing that we are, um, that we're a, a creature of our circumstances 
to believing that we are a creator of our circumstances. We are not designed or, or created to be acted upon, but to act. Mm-hmm. And that, that shift in thought, that belief that I can change the things around me, by I can do something, some part of me can exert, you know, will over what's happening around me. That, that shift was, was kind of just the beginning, just the belief that I could. Yes, love it. Um, the second is uh, powerful language. And that <clears throat> is the shift from using the language of a captive to using the language of a captain. And part of that came from Susan's book where she talked about, I don't say can't eat sugar. I say I don't eat or I won't eat sugar, right? She talked about shifting that language. <clears throat> and as I, as I studied it more and, and just watched the people around me, what I noticed was a, a, a vast difference in language. For example, it, it, I, we, we did an experiment the other day. Noreen, do you mind if I do one again with yeah, you? Yeah, that would be, okay? be great. Okay. Well, um, I want you to say a phrase and just feel the energy. And, and, and anyone else that's in the audience, I know you're muted out, and that's fine. But in, in wherever you're sitting, wherever you are, do the same thing. Just speak this phrase and just, just kind of quietly feel the emotional energy from that phrase. So the phrase is... I need to lose weight. Rob, I need to lose weight. Okay. Now I want you to use a different language. I want you to say, I commit to lose weight. Rob, I commit to lose weight. Did you feel an energy difference there? I definitely felt it. One was, the first was, I almost was coming from a helpless spot. The other one was definitely like I'm, I'm in control. I'm going to do this. I'm committing and I'm telling you, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Yeah, I totally felt it. Words are powerful. The tools of creation, right? Um, Even in the Bible, you know, one of the, one of the names for God is the word, right? Words are powerful. The tools of creation and, um, and, I, and I note again in the, in the Old Testament that one of the names of God is I am, right? That, that I am, if you say I am, whatever you put after that, you are literally creating, you're commanding your subconscious, you're commanding your entire body to, to shift in little ways, to shift the physiology, to shift the brain chemistry, to accommodate this new command that you as a, as a son or daughter of God have just given it. And um, Well, you know, I I talk about like in the beginning when I, you know, I'm kind of tech challenged. I say those words, which Mm -hmm. I don't know why I keep saying them. I'm not really tech challenged. It's just it's like in the moment. But before the the starting out bright goes on, I, I just said to my husband, "Okay, I need the old first pitch. After the first pitch, you'll relax and everything's great. Well, I did an exercise. It was with Marissa Peer. I mean, it was by tape. And she talks about looking out into an amusement park. And these are the power of the words that you tell yourself. And so you look out in the amusement park and you see the Ferris wheel and all these rides and people just screaming. The thing is, you don't know if they're screaming because they're excited or because they're scared to death. And the fact is, their bodies don't either. It's like the same adrenaline rush. And so instead of saying before here, before I'll get on, instead of saying, I'm scared to death, I'm like, I'm so excited. I'm so (laughs) excited. (laughs) And it's really true. I mean, it's like the more you tell your brain that, your brain will believe it. So, yeah, I totally get that. The language with the thoughts, um, they work in hand. So tell us more. Sure. So th- those were the first two shifts. And probably the, like, the beginning of all that power was shift in thoughts and a shift in language. The third shift is powerful knowledge, which is basically a commitment to be humble enough to say, I don't know everything. And I need, to, I need to learn more about whatever it is I want to change. If someone wants to make a change in finances, they need to learn how money works. If they want to make a change in health and nutrition, they need to learn 
about, you know, um, foods, healthy foods and nutrition. In my case, I had to learn about, uh, you know, sugar and flour addiction. Uh, but all, there's always learning involved when we change. And anyone that says, yeah, I don't want to have to learn. Just, just tell me how to do it. That's, that's, you know, that's, that's not a very committed way to do it. So powerful knowledge is this commitment to learn as much as we can. And that, that, that Googling of, you know, what, what causes hunger pangs was part of that powerful knowledge. Right. The fourth is powerful tribe. And that is a shift from going it alone to joining or creating a culture of support. Um, I joined a number of cultures of support as I started Brightline Eating. Um, I joined um, a, a few of the different, you know, the official <coughs> Brightline Eating Facebook group and a few other groups, uh, just side groups. There was a, a group of uh, uh, Christians, all different uh, Christian churches or mem- members of different Christian churches that got together and did a, a small group. And then I joined a group that's specifically for, for uh, my church. So, Church of De- Brightest Years for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But I want to like express to people that are, that are here tonight, there are groups for uh, Brightly Needers that are Jewish. There are groups for Brightly Needers that are Catholic. There are groups for Brightly Needers that are Protestant. There's all sorts of different, there are br- groups for Brightly Needers that do whole plant, uh, you know, whole food, um, plant-based. There are groups for Brightly Needers of all, all kinds. So I just want to point out that, that whatever your belief system is, you can, probably find a, a group that's, that's associated with that that's doing bright line eating and get some great support from people that, that are in, you know, your tribe, your, your group. And, and so I found, I yeah, found my I wanna, tribe. I want to interject because in the starting out bright group, I did create a spreadsheet that has about 50 groups categorized. But so for those who are in that group, um, you can check it out. But so that powerful tribe, yes, I totally right on with that too. Yeah. And then um, with my family, so I, there was joining a culture of support, but there was also creating a culture of support. With my family, I realized they're not going to change their habits for me, but I want to find a way to lovingly encourage them to give me support and not make them feel forced to do it. So I told my kids, so my, my, my then wife and I, we, we have, my ex-wife and I have seven children together. We're married 23 years. And um, so I went to my children and I told each of them, I said, when I lose an amount of weight equal to what each of you weighs, I'll take you on a daddy kid date and I'll put you on my back and carry you around the house. Um, and for my teenagers, they weren't all that keen about going on my back or I, I did end up carrying them all except for one on my back, but uh, you know, they could give or take a daddy kid date, but the younger kids were pretty motivated. And so they would do things like when we went out at Halloween, my, my now 12 year old, she's 12 year old, 12 years old today, but she was eight at the time. She would stand between me and the people that were offering candy and say, my dad's not going to have any of that. She'd like literally get in between and be like, nope, nope, he's not going to have any. Wow. And my oldest daughter and my, um, my then wife worked at Subway. And so if I would go to Subway to get a salad while I was out on the road, um, they bought a digital scale and they would weigh the portions out for me. So they were, again, the the family was pretty supportive um, with this encouragement. And uh, I think in the slideshow at the beginning, you had one, one of the slides was me with two of the kids on my back at once. And that was, I had lost an an amount of weight at that time equal to what both of those combined weighed. Wow. That's so great. So that was your part of your motivation or your tribe then the powerful that was powerful tribe was, okay. was getting, getting them on board with, with helping me and encouraging me because I knew I would need that. I, I knew I needed to be surrounded by people that would be helpful. That's amazing. Okay. So we have the thoughts, the language, knowledge, and tribe. Four yep. of the seven. Yeah. The fifth one, and this was probably the most impactful for me, was powerful motivation. And <clears throat> meaning that what, which emotion is motivating me at any given time. And it was a shift from being driven by fear to being driven by love and faith instead. So when we go back to the, that triune brain, right, we got brain one, which is the reptilian, brain two is the limbic, the heart, and brain three is the mind. And love and faith trigger and, and um, uh, engage the heart and mind. Fear triggers brain one, that reptilian brain, to defend. Wow. When we are living in fear, 
We are living out of brain one. We are in short-term thinking mode. We are constantly in fear. We're in adrenaline mode all the time. We're exhausted. And we are constantly fighting our, ourselves. We're constantly fighting against who we are. And <clears throat> part of this was driven home again by when Susan Pierce Thompson in her book talked about, um, oh gosh, she gave an example about trying to hold your breath for two minutes. I don't know. If right, you know. up the stairs. Okay. Right. You go up the stairs and it's like, well, you might do it for a hot minute, but um, yeah. pretty soon you're not going to be able to. Yeah. You're, you're at some point that brain one is going to go, this is crazy. This is a stupid idea. Or I just feel scared, whatever. It's going to force you to breathe. And I recognize that that's the same part of the brain that drives us to eat. Mm-hmm. The part of the brain that protects us from not breathing is the same part that drives us to eat. And as I, when I explain that to people who don't have a sugar addiction, they get it. I'm like, the, the, imagine trying to hold your breath for two minutes. How, how hard would your brain fight? That's a hard mind fought to get me to eat my, you know, second dinner. Right. That's, well, that's even how, you talked about that feeling of the hunger pain of feeling fear. Yeah. Like your first reflex is, oh my gosh, I can't have that. Right. If that's the reptilian brain then. And it's it, like you said, we kind of have to step out and see ourselves and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a spirit being. That's my body. It's the vehicle I, I live inside. And, and, but my body, mind, and heart, those are, those are tools for me. Those are part of, but they're, I don't have to do what they say. I can, I can make a decision. When we, when we kind of separate it out a little bit, we, we realize that we are, we are powerful creators that just, it makes a big, big difference. Like we're, we let the vehicle drive sometimes. That's, we don't want to do that. Well, you know, and even I just have to interject here that what's, what we're seeing in the world a lot is being driven by fear and things that sometimes you, if you look back, you're like, this is, does not make sense to be so fearful of some things. Yeah. And so, yeah, to uh, step out a little bit. And like have the second and third part of the brain do more action. You, I, I just, you know, I read something this morning and I wrote it down because it was so impactful. It will take me just a quick second to, to find it here. Um, here. I already got a request to keep you for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Fear. The worst of all enemies can be effectively cured by forced repetition of acts of courage. That's Napoleon Hill from the book, Think and Grow Rich, chapter nine, Persistence. Fear, the worst of all enemies, can be effectively cured by forced repetition of acts of courage. Wow. Not just thinking about it, but an act, an action, small action even. Which means we have to push through fear. Right. But we do it over and over and over again. We wire our brains to realize we can do this. We are more powerful than the fear that we're feeling. And that, I think, is the part that for every bright line eater, that's, the, that's that veil that you have to push through. Once you get through that, you're like, okay, I can do this. And until you get through that, you're, you're on and off the wagon constantly. You know, like in the beginning, those days when you're like, can I really do this for the rest of my life? But then you, you know, you're, the action is, I can't think about the rest of my life, but I'm going to prepare tomorrow's breakfast. I, right. can, I can plan tomorrow's lunch and dinner. Those things are set. Then, you know, let the day lie where it lies, but you are taking an action, not just thinking about it in fear and, you know, being scared like, oh, gosh, this is too hard. But, yeah, that's... Really incredible. That's, uh, that's the perfect analogy, what, what you just said, because every one of those days where you just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with today one day at a time, that's an act of courage. And when you do that over and over and over again, what, what does the Bible say? Sufficient is, is the day unto the evil thereof, right? You can, you can manage in a day all the, all the garbage that comes at you in a day. Right. And if you, uh, if you do that and just deal with that day, that's an act of courage. And you do that. 365 times. Now you've had a year of courage and you are more and more capable. And that's, that's the whole principle of growth, right? That's, that's, that's how we expect our kids to grow into figuring out how to be adults. And that's how God expects us to learn how to, how to be our best selves, right? 
That yeah. This opposition isn't a isn't a curse. It's it's his way of going. Hey, here's how you learn how to do this stuff. Right? Here's how you become your best self. I'm, I'm so excited to see you grow, my child. You know, that's kind of how I how I envision that. But uh, so we that, have to get to number six, Rob. Sure. I'll ju- I'll just quickly comment that number five, that powerful motivation, that shift did not just change my bright line eating, but it changed um, my ability to be a better dad, my ability to communicate. It, it changed a, a number of areas of life and that, that just made a huge change. But I'll, in the sake of time, I'll jump on to number six. Number six, I, I call powerful sacrifice, but I had a, a friend that listened to this and she's like, you can't say the word sacrifice. Nobody likes that word. It's, it's always an icky word. You gotta give it something else, but it's really a two-sided. It's powerful sacrifice, and the other side of that is powerful gratitude. So it's, it's really one principle, and that is, and then there's another, there's a story, um, another story from the Book of Mormon that I drew a lot of strength from when I first started. There's a story of a group of people. They, in fact, they had been, remember I told you the wicked people were always attacking the righteous people. There, it was a small group of this wicked, these wicked people that heard about God and decided they wanted to follow him, and so they made a commitment to follow God. But as they did, they realized we've been fighting all our lives and we don't want to do this anymore. They, they were, they were essentially, they didn't use the word addiction in there, but they were essentially recognizing they were addicted to this pattern of warfare. And so to, when they made their covenant with God, they dug a big hole in the, in the earth and they buried their swords. They buried them all the way and covered them up. And, and they did this as a public ceremony with their, with their powerful tribe, right? They did this as a public ceremony to demonstrate we are going to follow God now. And they, they made three covenants that they would not fight anymore, that they would do no more harm, that they would, um, that they would help a brother or sister if they needed help, and that they would be industrious, that they would work hard after that, because they had been kind of a lazy warfare people. And when I read that account, it struck me that I was burying my sugar and flour. Wow. I couldn't pay attention to what everyone had. There were other people that were going to carry their swords, that were going to carry their sugar and flour, right? But I had, for me, in my life, I had to bury it in order to make my change. And I felt so, such a kinship with these ancient people in this book of scripture. And I said, I got to do what they're doing. And so I wrote those. Sorry. I wrote those promises down that I would do no more harm to my own body and that I would do strive to, to never not do harm to anyone else that I would um, help another person that I would serve when I could and that I would be industrious and I would work hard. And so I started to notice as, and as this change was taking place, bright line eating, <clears throat> I was starting to sleep better mm-hmm. with, with diabetes I had been waking up every hour and a half to go to the bathroom. And now that my blood sugars were down to normal, I, the first night that I slept seven hours in a row was glorious. I remember how wonderful it was. I celebrated. Wow. And so I noticed that now I wasn't staying up late at night watching TV and eating, you know, second or third dinner. And I was getting up earlier in the morning. And so I would get up and I would find work to do. I would find ways to, to be of service to my then wife, you know, to, uh, help clean up, to do the dishes, to do other things. Um, I would find ways to be industrious, to go out and work in the yard or, or go on a walk. I would find ways to serve things that I just hadn't been doing before because I'd been so consumed with food that I didn't have the bandwidth. And so it, it was what I got back, that powerful gratitude. It, it's a shift from focusing on what we're giving up to focusing on what we're getting instead. I stopped pining after the food and started going, I love getting up early. I love, um, you know, uh, being able to reach all my parts in the shower and not have to, (laughs) you know. Oh, isn't that something? Yeah. I love being able to run (laughs) to the mailbox instead of walking. Um, I do have upstairs up to the second floor. Yeah. Just walk up a flight of stairs. I love being able to open the freezer, see the, um, see the half gallon of ice cream and go, no, I don't want it because I love who I am. I, I'm those, I love those things so much that I didn't care 
for the food anymore, it didn't have the same emotional pull that it used to. Um, and then the, the seventh was a powerful focus. And I, I really drew that a lot from chapter two of Atomic Habits. And that is uh, a shift from focusing on what we're doing on our behavior to focusing on who we're becoming. Sorry. Okay. A, a spiritual leader years ago, uh, Richard G. Scott said, we become who we want to be by being who we want to become every day. And, and so instead of focusing on, uh, you know, I'm going to eat this, I'm going to eat that. Yes, I did keep my bright lines. But instead of having all my focus on the bright lines, I would focus instead and say, I'm becoming a healthy man. The bright lines are how I do it, right? That's the what. But I was concerned with the who. I was concerned with the what I'm becoming, with the why. And so um, every day, I, it, you know, it was hard to look in the mirror as a 300 70 pound man, it was hard to look in the mirror and say, I'm 170 pounds or I'm 200 pounds. It's hard to, hard to do that because it, it just is cognitive dissonance. But I can look in the mirror and say, I'm a healthy man today. I am right now, but I am a healthy man because I'm keeping my lines right. And that I could do each day with, um, with, uh, you know, with honesty. Um, somebody asked, how much have you lost in total? I lost a total of 200 pounds. Um, I probably, to be honest, really only needed to lose about 180, 185. Um, but when you get that far into the journey, you're like, well, it sounds way cooler to say I lost 200 pounds than to say I lost 185 pounds. So like, I'm just going to go a little bit lower, tag, <laughs> you know, tag that goal weight, and then gain back up. So I, I did uh, put back on uh, some pounds after that. I've put on a little bit more as I went to the gym and did some working out because I, I was skin and bones and I've put on a little bit of muscle now. So, uh, and is it about the weight anymore? It's really not. It's about how I feel and about, and about health. I have, I did during COVID. I want to just, just be, be honest and real with people. I did fall off the wagon a little bit. I kept my sugar and flour lines. I've not broken those at all, but I did break the, uh, the quantities lines. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, it, again, it was, COVID happened right at the end of my, I was already at ideal weight during my marriage, you know, as, as the marriage was kind of coming to a close, but the divorce uh, became final just as COVID was starting. And I was a single dad with then four kids in the house. Now I've got two kids with me doing all those th things hitting at once. I'll be honest, I, I, I broke a little bit and sometimes took some extra quantities. Um, as, as know, a it's interesting you say that. Um... And there's, I'm hearing like there's a stress factor going in too at that time. I was just ill in December and I just felt totally carb depleted. And I've heard these stories of, from other people who whatever happens, all of a sudden there's maybe the willpower gap. I don't know, but I decided to put myself on maintenance for two weeks to just restore the carbs because I know like the brain runs on carbs, right? Yeah. So I've, I did a grain at dinner for now seven days, I think, but tonight I didn't and I'm feeling better. I'm really glad I did it. Yeah. Just, it wasn't a matter of gaining, losing weight. It was really about, I didn't want to break my lines because I was feeling weak and depleted, carb depleted in my body. And that was my main motivation. I didn't want to break my lines. I just wanted to feel healthier mentally and physically. And I think I'm there now. I feel like I can, you know, I'm going to taper off now and then go back to weight loss. But, you know, that's one strategy for someone who may feel like they're in your shoes that, for that, you know, where, you know, that's it's getting um, very difficult. Um, I can't believe the time because we, we try to stay and um, I have so many more things to ask you. Um, but for the, for the sake of time, um, I do want to ask you one more question. Those were the seven powerful, powerful shifts and they're just absolutely incredible. And one thing Rob is not going to tell you is he does all, he does do coaching. It's called powerful identity coaching. And I know you didn't expect me to say this, but 
if you are interested, get a hold of Rob for that powerful identity coaching. As you can hear, he has some great ideas. Um, but as we are closing up on this hour, knowing what you know now in this journey, there's someone who is maybe like you, who has maybe multiple things going on, going wrong in their life. And they've got a mountain to climb with their health. What would you say to them? I would say the very first and best thing you can do is to believe that it is possible, to believe it can be another way. And then to just start moving in that direction. Move, move in that direction as do what you can from where you are today with what you have. And if that means buying the book and getting started, awesome. If it means um, joining a boot camp, I did join a boot camp about halfway through, then that's great. If it means just praying to be able to believe that it's possible, start there. But that, that, that belief is that first step. Well, Rob, this has been an incredible hour. Um, just absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for everything that you offered here and sharing your story and just some wonderful ideas. I love the visualizations. You know, they, they will stay with me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just feel incredibly blessed that you could come on and uh, talk about your life and um, success and struggles. You've made it real. And uh, we just got so much. Do you have any last words? I um, just, I'm, again, grateful to Susan Pierce Thompson for uh, creating the Brightline Eating Program, for, you know, compiling all that information in one place where I could get hold of it. Um, I, I, and I believe God makes it possible for us to change. And I, I honestly believe that, you know, between God and, and, and you know, Susan Pierce Thompson, uh, who's, you know, through whom, I, you know, he's working in this way. I, I just feel like I'm, you know, grateful that I'm going to statistically live probably three to four decades longer than I would have otherwise. And it'll be a lot more fun. So well, and, and you are that thin thread, too, to those who will be listening to this. And thank you for letting me record it, because your words will fall on ears that will hear this. And with all of that uh, other information, I know it will be a blessing to them. So I'm going to close and thank you again, Rob. I'm gonna close as I do each week. Good night, stay bright. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. So Rob, how would you like to play Three Question Thursday? Bring it on. <laughs> okay, first question. So with all of this, what did you learn about yourself? I, what I learned about myself, I believe to be true of everybody. And that is that as, as children of God, and, and again, I don't want to push my spiritual belief on anybody else, whether you, you know, God or spirit universe, whatever your belief is, but I, I believe we are children of God and that we've inherited creative capacity from God in that respect, in the same way that, my children have inherited qualities from me. But, uh, and so I believe I have learned that I have the power to create a better life than I had before. And I believe actually that we, that we are constantly creating. Whether we, if you're alive, if you're breathing, you're creating. You can't not create. We're either creating something good or if we're constantly envisioning and feeling negatively, then we're creating something negative. And uh, that, that's a gift that when we learn how to use makes a big difference. That's great. Okay. Another question. This is going rogue. The other day <laughs> we talked about the topic of testosterone. Oh yeah. And you had some information that was pretty interesting. And yes. for the, especially for the men, but for the women too, what was your observation? So, yeah, just sharing my experience, I, um, again, I was married during my Brightline eating journey. 
you know, but, but from, from my highest to, to uh, my goal weight, I was married that entire time and I was not divorced until afterward. And uh, so one of the things that we noticed partway through the journey, this is probably when I was down about a hundred pounds, 120 pounds, something somewhere in that ballpark, my, my then wife expressed to me, she's like, man, you're, you're a little bit more amorous than normal. You know, you're a little bit more desirous. And, uh, uh, what, and, and we actually talked to a, a, a counselor about that and realized uh, through, with, with his help that, you know, the body produces, for men especially, the body produces a certain amount of testosterone. And that testosterone gets absorbed by, you know, the body. By how, how, so if in a larger body, a 400-pound man produces a whole lot more testosterone than a 200-pound man. And as you lose weight, especially if you're losing it quickly, as I was at the beginning, I did, it was definitely slowed down at the end. But as I was losing weight quickly at the beginning, my body continued to produce the, the 400 pound man version of testosterone. And I was now, you know, under 300 pounds. And so that was, it was obviously making changes <laughs> that, that could, you know, kind of mess up or irritate you know, mess up your intimate life and kind of irritate your, irritate my spouse. And so the, you know, the council was kind of, you know, go take a walk, go to the gym, go do something, <laughs> lift weights or do something, kind of burn that off. And, uh, and so I, I just, as I've joined in some of the men's group, I've shared that with them that, Hey, if you come from high numbers and you're losing fairly quickly, just be kind to your wife, <laughs> you know, just go, go take a walk, <laughs> go take the dog for a walk or something. Um, new information. Yeah. Okay. And now the third question. We sure. talked also the other day about this, this journey, you learned a lot about yourself as far as um, communication yeah. and developed right. like an anti a technique as far as listening, I believe with your children. Yeah. Yeah, and you said it in the, you said it in the zoom about you felt like you became a better dad. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Sure. You do. I just want to, one quick thing on the testosterone. I do want to say that it does eventually normalize. <laughs> it does, there is hope. It does, takes a few months, but it, it does come, yeah, you know, go back to normal and testosterone production normalizes to whatever way you are. Okay. Sorry. To answer your question, um, I learned an emotional control technique that helped me immensely. This was part of the journey. This I was studying this as part of trying to be a better communicator, uh, better uh, than husband, uh, better father, and, and also control my emotions around food. And it, it goes like this. So you've got this little piece that's between the brain one and brain two, and it's called the amygdala. The amygdala is about the size and roughly the shape of an almond, but it does so, it's super powerful. So it is, it's the database operator for the brain. And the, what it does is it, it creates efficiency by looking at um, past times when you felt similarly, and it just creates a similar cocktail of chemicals. So for example, imagine you, ha you have a run-in with a toxic coworker today, um, and your toxic coworker just gets you all frustrated, and you just feel angry, right? You, you want to go hide, you want to dissociate, you want to get away from her or him, and you just want to go hide. Well, tomorrow, when you see that toxic coworker, they may be 100 feet away, what's going to happen? What are you, you going to feel? Stress. Because, yeah, you're going to feel that stress, right? Your amygdala looks literally looks at that coworker and says, oh, I see the coworker coming again. Do you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of yesterday when she chewed you out. So I'm going to, to save time. I'm going to fill you with the same cocktail of chemicals. I'm going to pump you with adrenaline and cortisol, just like I did yesterday. Boom. Now you're stressed. There, we just saved some time. Go for it, right? But your, your coworker might be coming to apologize. Mm. She might be coming to give you a raise. She might be coming to say happy birthday. She might be coming for any number of reasons. You have no idea what they are, but your body already assumes that she's coming for something bad and it defends, right? So it gets, it gets all stressed. So that's what the amygdala does, is, is does those things. And so the idea here in this is to turn off the amygdala and take control and replace it with something that we want to put there instead. And so... Uh, there's, there's two phrases I'll, I'll share in just a moment, but the first thing you need to do, and this is homework for everybody, right? You need to pick a time in your life, a, a, a vivid memory. It's got to be vivid and you need to, it needs to be a powerful, positive emotion. 
Now, this could be the birth of one of your children. This could be anything. It could be any of a number of things. It doesn't have to be spiritually significant. The births of my children were super spiritually significant, but the thing I chose was far less spiritually significant. But it was, it was a time when I, all right, a little vulnerable here, as a, as a, as a very heavy man, I struggled with self-image and self-esteem. Uh, my, my, ward, uh, my, my church congregation had a talent show one time, and I wrote a rap. And there's nothing sexier than a middle-aged white guy rapping, right? Anyhow, I went up there on stage, and I did a, a very humorous rap that incorporated the names of, of several people in the congregation. And, and you know, it, it, was, it was fun. Uh, and uh, it was to the tune of a rap that the youth at that time liked. And so it was, it was kind of popular. Anyhow, my point is, I, I went way out of my comfort zone, and I did this. At the very end of the rap, my, uh, my now 17-year-old daughter, I think she was like 13 or 14 then, came running up and threw a pillow on the stage. And I reached out, and I dropped my microphone and did a mic drop right onto the pillow. <laughs> there was this downbeat, right? Just right at the end, perfectly timed. And then I looked out at this congregation of my friends and family and just thought, I have just made a complete fool of myself. And for a second, it was like absolutely um, just, just super quiet. And I thought, oh, my goodness, they're, they're going to hate me. And then there were, they just interrupted in thunderous applause. And I can't tell you how for a, you know, again, seeking others approval is not the whole idea of life. But for a guy that had poor self-esteem, that was like just food for the soul. And I walked off stage listening to that thunderous applause and real, realizing that was, that was for me that, that I had, I had served people and that they had appreciated and enjoyed that. And that, so that became my memory. So you need to find a memory that for you is a powerful, positive emotion. You would, you um, find a way to describe it in, uh, in detail, but in, in as few words as possible. And then you're inserted into these two phrases that I'm going to give you. The first phrase, um, we've got someone commenting that's a Harry Potter geek and says like a producing a Patronus charm. Yes, absolutely. Very, very much. I'm a Potterhead myself. I love that. So you, here are the two phrases. The first one is a question and you got to like phrase these exactly. Do you know what this reminds me of? And so what I did is I practiced hundreds of times doing this, asking out loud, do you know what this reminds me of? And then answering it, this reminds me of, and here's where you, each of you would insert your powerful positive moment. So mine was, this reminds me of the mic drop at the end of my rap parody where I walked off the stage to thunderous applause. And as I say that right now, this moment, I can close my eyes, I can see, I can visualize that moment. And I actually get little tingles up my spine to this day, thinking about that because it makes me feel happy. When I do, I, I stand up a little straighter, right? My, my spine gets straightened. My, uh, I smile. Um, I breathe a little deeper. Guess what those things do? Those things put you in brain two and brain three because you're feeling good. You're feeling positive. And when you're standing up straight and breathing deeper, you've got more oxygen in the brain. You can solve problems. It takes you out of fight or flight mode and puts you into problem solving mode. It's just a trick to get your physiology to obey. So you ask, do you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of, and you describe your powerful positive moment. What that does is it, like I said, it pulls you out of brain one, it puts you into brain two and brain three. Here's what I experienced. My, my now uh, 19 year old daughter, who then uh, was, I think, 15, 16, we fought all the time. We'd butt heads and she would, we'd have screaming matches. And before this time, she would, she would come and yell at me and I would just yell louder, right? Which is the worst thing a parent could do, but that's, what, that's where I was. I was living in fear and I was like, oh, she's, you know, I'm going to lose, you know, so we got a mutiny here on the ship. I'm the captain and I'm going to lose control of this thing. And, and so I would yell back. But when I started to use this, this thing, I would do it quietly. And I even did a little, I uh, anchored it with a hand motion of, of a mic drop. And so what I would do, is I remember vividly this one time she was screaming at me and in my mind, I was silently saying over and over again, do you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the mic drop at the end of my rap parody where I walked off the stage to the thunder applause and I would do it over and over. And as I did it, you know, behind my back, I was doing the little mic drop and it, it changed my physiology. I could, I now was no longer responding in fear. I didn't feel any drive to yell. And it was kind of like, if you've ever watched those movies where suddenly the person is in slow motion, that's what was happening. 
I was like, hey, I've got this space in between stimulus and response that, that Stephen Covey talks about, right? That space between stimulus and response where I can now choose what I want to do. I have a moment where I am free from the, that tug, that absolute necessity to yell. And so I said, I'm going to choose to listen instead. And I listened. It created a safe space in me. And you can't pour from an empty cup, right? So I created a safe space for her. So I listened. And then and, and I heard her pain. And she didn't feel appreciated. And I said, you know what? You're right. I'm so sorry that you don't feel appreciated. I do appreciate you. I do acknowledge that you do a lot around here. That disarmed her. And she's like, that's kind of weird. You know, who are you? What have you done with my dad? But, um, but after two or three of these times, and I was probably more like a dozen of these times, she started to speak in a softer voice. She didn't need to yell anymore because she knew she'd be heard. Somewhere instinctively, she knew she'd be heard. And foolishly, at first, I thought, look, I changed her, but I didn't. What I did is I created, I used that creative power to create a safe space where she could be her best self. She was choosing to be her best. I didn't change her. She chose to be her best self. It changed my parenting. It changed the way I approached Bright Line Eating that little emotional technique. It changes the way that I communicate with people. It, even now, when I feel fear, I do that. It's very much, Doreen, like your first pitch, right? Where you, like you're visualizing that baseball game and that first pitch, it's the very same thing. I'm just visualizing something that I love, it fills me with happiness, and it makes a, it makes a difference. Wow. <laughs> that is so amazing, Rob. What a technique. I can, I can picture using it. I don't know how long it would take for me to, you know, to get good at it, but I could actually picture using that technique and what a difference it would make in life to be yeah. able to create that pause in between the stimulus and, you know, your reaction to it. So, wow. Rob, again, thank you so much. Thanks for saying yes and coming out on Starting Out Bright and Thank you for playing three question three. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so great. much, Doreen. This has been an honor. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Stay bright. <laughs> <laughs>